<laughs> What's going on, everybody? It's Monday, and I had a crazy busy weekend. It was my dad's birthday on Friday. We celebrated it with him on Saturday. It's my wife's birthday today. Um, on Friday, Lucy had her powder puff game, so the whole family went uh, and watched her. Uh, she played running back, super fun. She, she did really well. I had a game on Saturday and then Sunday, scored a goal on Saturday. I'm actually recording this on Sunday, um, the day before it, it airs. Uh, so I don't know how her game uh, turns out yet, uh, but it's tonight. Um, super fun times. Now, I wanted to get into um, this discussion from last week about grail cards. And uh, a lot of people submitted what their, what their grail cards are. And, and the cards that they really hope to obtain at some point. And it's fun because some of these are stories of people who actually got the grail card. And some of these are stories of people who have grail cards that might, you know, be unrealistic. Some of these grail cards are not expensive cards. And some of them are tens of thousands of dollars. And I think it's fun to hear about, you know, a wide variety of people's interests and as these, uh, as the I'm reading over the the responses from people, and I'm talking about, I'm going to splash pictures of the cards on the screen so you can see them, and you can see just why uh, people are into these specific cards. I think it was super fun reading over these, so we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of uh, the episode. I think that this week's question is a really interesting one. It's one that I genuinely want to hear your take on. It's something that I think we need to continue to talk about in the hobby. So I'm excited for those. Uh, my buddy Ed sent me some cool stuff. He sent me the second year Sparky Anderson card, uh, sent me a cool Clemens card. Then he sent uh, some Matt, Matt Manning cards. Matt play, uh, pitched in the second game of a doubleheader on Saturday uh, for the Tigers. He got the loss, but he pitched really well. Uh, I think he pitched six and two-thirds innings, had like seven strikeouts. I think he gave up four earned runs. So, um, you know, he had a good weekend, even though uh, they didn't get the win. Uh, Tigers are really struggling to score runs right now, so all their pitchers are struggling to get wins. Uh, but anyway, he performed well, so that was awesome. So enough of that. Let's go ahead and take a look at some responses from all of you about the Grail cards that you want most in your collection. My basketball Grail cards, there are two. The Bird Magic Rookie Card with the Julius Irving 1972 Tops Rookie Card. In football, my grill cards would be the 1935 National Chickle Newt Rockney, the 1955 Topps All-American Four Horsemen, the 55 Topps All-American Jim Thorpe, and the 62 Topps Ernie Davis. My baseball grill would be the 53 Topps Jackie Robinson, Satchel Paige, and Roy Campanella. I think there were some great answers in here. And one of the things I liked about this particular response is it talked about all three of the major sports, you know, basketball, football, and baseball. And and the other thing I liked a lot is not all of these cards are super expensive. You know, for example, the the Roy Campanella, 53 tops, is, is a very affordable card. Yet it's one that is, you know, really desired by this collector. And I think that that's very cool. Um, you know, the basketball cards, you know, you got Dr. J, you got Magic and Bird, you know, and then the football cards, there's some, you know, I continue to think that for whatever reason, football cards are super affordable. And some people, are, they'll will always be affordable, Greg, there will never be a high demand for them. And, and that might be, um, but, you know, as a fan of football, as a collector of cards, um, I'm going to continue taking advantage of that. You know, I have quite a few uh, guys that I collect in football. You know, I have a full Gale Sayers base run. Um, I've got several Jim Brown cards, including his rookie, which I was fortunate enough to pick up not that long ago. You know, I've got some Unitas cards. I've got some Bart Starr cards, 
Um, I just picked up that Otto Graham rookie card. I'm working on my Otto Graham run. I'm missing his 51 Bowman and his 54, I believe, are the two that I'm still missing for Otto Graham. But one of the things that was mentioned is a really, really cool set, which is Topps made this All-American set. And it was referenced for a cut. You saw a couple of the cards just now. And one of those cards was the Four Horsemen card. And then one of those cards was the Jim Thorpe card. And this set has some really, really great players. And it's kind of cool, too, because it talks about it has cards of players that don't really have many cards because they were all Americans years and years before. And there might only be one or two of their cards. So for a lot of players, it's one of their better cards, if not their best card in you know, existence is from that particular set. But it covers this wide range of players. And it's also cool because it features them as from their colleges. And, and I always have a thing. I, I really like college football. I think college football is huge. And so if you've not checked out that All-American set, highly recommend it. You know, the Thorpe card, you know, there's a new Rockney card. I mean, there's a lot of really cool cards in that set. I highly encourage you to check it out if you haven't. I continue, <laughs> I will continue to be adding to my football card collection. Uh, but check that out. Great answer there. Let's take a look at the next one. Growing up, my grail card was a 1979 Topps Ozzie Smith rookie. I bought it with my first ever paycheck. In recent years, it was the 48 Bowman Stan Musial rookie. I bought it when I sold my house last year. My next grail card would be the 38 Gowdy Bob Feller rookie because he is the only chief petty officer in the MLB Hall of Fame. I will be retiring from the Coast Guard as a chief petty officer in two years after 20 years of active duty. So this is my target date to buy the card couple reasons why I wanted to bring this one up I thought was a great answer. Number one, you could see the evolution monetarily of the cards. It was like, as a kid, the Grail card was an Ozzy Smith, a 79 tops Ozzy Smith card, which is not a cheap card, but it's not an expensive card. It's a card that someone in a, uh, a lower price point could afford. In, I mean, unless you're looking for it in like a nine or a 10, even an eight gets pretty expensive. But you know, you can get a nice copy in a six or a seven for a reasonable price. And it's so cool that he said, he said he took his first paycheck to buy that card. And then it kind of evolved and moved up to a pretty big card, which is the Stan Musial 48 Bowman, which I love the 48 Bowman set. It's got some great cards in it. It's got the Yogi Berra rookie. It's got a cool Bob Feller. It's got a Phil Rizzo. It's got a lot of really great cards. But that Stan Musial picture is so great. He looks so young. His hat looks worn and weathered. It's all messed up. I love that card. And then the reasoning behind wanting that 38 Gowdy uh, Bob Feller, you know, the fact that Bob Feller served in our military, was a chief petty officer. You know, I personally, you know, a lot of people say, why do you collect who you collect? Why do you like who you like? One of the reasons I, I like Bob Feller and, and collect Bob Feller and want more Bob Feller cards, same with Warren Spawn, same with Yogi Berra, is those guys are veterans that served. You know, same with Ted Williams. I've got some Ted Williams cards as well, and I'm always looking to add to them. So those vets, those guys who served in the military, to me, hold a special place in my heart. And, and one way I like to honor them is to collect their cards. So I love that reasoning behind the Bob Feller. Uh, I appreciate your service to our country and the Coast Guard. Congratulations on, sounds like, 18 years of service, which is outstanding, which is awesome. You know, a lot of people in our country tend to kind of take our military for granted until we need it. And, you know, it's one of those things where when, you know, you don't really notice something, you don't notice it because it's doing its job, right? You don't notice your hot water heater until it goes out. And then you're like, oh my gosh, my hot water heater. You know, you don't notice your microwave and how much you use it until it breaks. Well, one of the things I think a lot of people don't notice but should is our military. I mean, we live in such a safe situation here in the United States 
And it's, it's not just a coincidence. It's because of those out there that have served and are serving in our armed forces to protect us and allow us to have the luxurious lifestyle that we have. And I can tell you, I have a good friend who's currently, you know, overseas uh, f- serving in the military. And, you know, his kids are back home. He's not seeing his kid. I mean, it's, it's a tough one. And there's a lot of sacrifice that those guys make. And I really personally uh, like to collect guys that served our country. And I really think our heroes that, again, I think sometimes, you know, we, we maybe take for granted. I sure don't, but I think some do. My grail card is the 1952 Topps Willie Mays, which I was fortunate enough to pick up at my first national in 2022. I bought a PSA Authentic for $2,500, which represented a huge card expenditure for me. The dealer told me I could bring it back at his table at any time, and he would give me $2,500 back in cash. For this reason, I almost took it back to him because I really wanted a numerical grade. However, a numerical grade, together with the eye appeal I wanted, would probably cost substantially more, so I kept the authentic. After several months of wondering why my grail card did not get a numerical grade, I sent it to SGC since they now give a reason on the holder, such as evidence of trimming. I sent it to SGC in the PSA holder. To my shock and awe, SGC gave it a 2.5. I guess someone just wanted it authenticated by PSA. The PSA slab said authentic, not authentic altered. I love this. I love this story. This is from Adam. I've mentioned Adam a few times recently. His he's got a great uh, a great channel called Vintage Sanctuary. Uh, super positive, super enthusiastic. Has a great collection. Loves showing his cards. Highly recommend his channel. Um, I've be- recently, you know, in the last two three months, become a very big fan of his channel. Whenever one of his videos comes out, I'm super excited to see it. And I'm also really excited because this week he and I are getting together and I am going to have a conversation with him um, about basically I appeal cards. And and I think that he's got a really high I appeal collection. Um, I'm going to sit down with him and, and hopefully we'll post that later in the week. Likely going to post on Friday, uh, another busy weekend. I'm leaving late, late Thursday night to go off to Strongsville. I'm coming home from Strongsville uh, early Sunday morning. And so it's gonna be a crazy weekend again. Uh, But on Wednesday is when we're planning on recording with Adam. And again, I hope to post that by Friday if I can get it all edited and loaded and everything in time. So I really hope that you check that out. But check out his channel. But this story about the 52 tops Willie Mays, that's a great one. And one of the things that I think a lot of people forget is that PSA, they will just authenticate a card. And and if a card is altered, they they won't slab it. So if you see a card in a PSA holder that's just authentic, you know, it, it might just be that the person wanted authenticated. But if you've ever sent a card in that there was evidence of trimming or evidence of color or... Um, you know, likelihood of it not being real or whatever, they don't slab it and say authentic altered. They, they send it back. Um, so it's, it's a certainly, it's an interesting thing. It can get a little bit, you know, kind of complicated with, you know, well, is, are all authenticated cards unaltered? Well, no, not necessarily. It's, it is a little complicated, but it is interesting that there are cards that people have sent to PSA just to be authenticated. And those cards, if they got sent in for a grade, might do okay. So it sounds like Adam had a great situation here. It worked out really well for him, and he got a really cool card. So anyway, uh, look for that video later in the week. My ultimate grill card that I hope to acquire someday when the kids are off the payroll is the 1936 Worldwide Gum Joe DiMaggio. I love the image on the card, 
plus being his first card as a Yankee, it holds a special place in my heart. All right, so this one, my buddy Darren from Return to Collecting, another great channel. Uh, you guys know how much I love Darren. We do our, you know, our uh, collaboration video once a month. Um, I'm really excited because this weekend I'm going to be in Strongsville. Darren's going to be in Strongsville. We're going to get to hang out, uh, spend some time together. I'll make sure that I get him in uh, some of my Strongsville videos. Um, and, and then a couple weeks after that, I'm going to be in Colorado for one of Lucy's soccer tournaments. And I'm going to see Darren again. And we're going to hang out a little bit. And I'm hoping to get over to his house to see some of his collection. And uh, that's the plan. And if that happens, I'll try to get some of that on video too, to uh, show, you, show you some of his stuff, which I know you've seen on his channel. And if you haven't seen it on his channel, go over to Darren's channel, check out you know, his top 50 cards in his collection, his top, you know, I mean, it's crazy. His monthly pickups, it's, it's crazy what he's got. So check out his channel if you haven't. But the card that he, he talks about here, that's like his grail card, you know, this Worldwide Gum Joe DiMaggio. It, there, there's so much about that. See, some people don't like black and white cards. I don't mind black and white cards at all. I actually like black and white photo photography. I like Ansel Adams photography. I think it's beautiful. In some ways, I think it's, it's almost more beautiful than color. And some people are, you know, throwing rotten fruit at the screen as I say that. But I genuinely believe that some black and white photography is gorgeous and and the thing about this particular picture is it it tell the photo tells a story the photo tells a story i mean think about what's happening at this time you're coming out of the great depression right so money's not just falling from trees in this country at this time and you see joe dimaggio's hats on it's clearly not a new hat you know every time i've ever seen Derek jeter in a hat. It looks like Derek Jeter's hat is brand new. Not the case here with Joe DiMaggio. It tells a story of the era. The hat's almost even like a little crooked, and he's not doing it crooked to be cool like Pokey Reese used to do, right? He, he's got it on a little crooked because he's just kind of, he doesn't have this giant smile. He's just kind of looking at the camera. And, and, and to me, you look at that picture and you're like, it tells, it's a time capsule of where the country was at the time. Even for a guy like Joe DiMaggio. Now, obviously, this is not peak Joe DiMaggio. This is not hit streak time Joe DiMaggio. This is before all of that. But still, it's, it's, a, it's a time capsule photo. And that's part of what makes the card amazing is the photo. But the other thing that makes the card amazing is that it wasn't a U.S. national release. You could pull it from, you know, packs at the at the liquor store or at the supermarket. It, it's a hard to find card because of the distribution that wasn't there. It's a really cool card, and and I totally understand why it's so expensive, and it's really expensive. I mean, even in a one, I mean, even in a one. It's thousands and thousands of dollars. And I totally get it. Who it is, the photo, the story, the distribution, the rarity. It's an awesome card. For this week's question, my grail card is the 1935 National Chickle, Bronco Nagurski. To the extent that we can compare cards across different sports in the hobby, I would say that the 35 Nagurski is kind of like the T206 Wagner for football collectors. The difference is that, unlike the Wagner, the Nagurski is still attainable with a bit of saving and for a lot of collectors. Now, it's not cheap. Around 8 k for an SGC1 is about the best I have seen. But at some point, I'll make this card purchase with a few years worth of hobby savings. My goal is to obtain a rookie card for every pro football Hall of Famer. The Nagurski is by far the toughest one to pick up, so it will, without a doubt, be my grail card. Uh, man, if you've ever seen video of Bronco Nagurski running, this guy was a fullback, 
And the guy was massive. I mean, like an enormous human being. It's like Derrick Henry. You know, in today's day, Derrick Henry is this tall, big, strong horse who just gets the ball over and over and over and just runs through people and just moves piles. That was Bronco Nagurski. And when you look at some of the the footage and you you hear some of the stories, you know, it's no wonder that when they talk about all-time Hall of Famers, like top 20, 25 players of all time, that his name would come up because the guy was like an absolute monster. And this is in a physical time, but it isn't a time of football where it's like now where everyone is massive. He was massive. And other people, there were big guys, but he was massive. And again, do yourself a favor and at some point, check out some of his highlight footage and it's wild. This is a, a rare card, but it's not crazy rare. I mean, when he mentions it, when, when, he, when, when the comment is made about it being like the Honus Wagner, that's not to say it's as rare as the Honus Wagner. It's rare. You know, this is like a card, like, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred copies of it are in existence versus the Wagner, which is much less. But it's, the, it's like the iconic, um, recognizable, sought after vintage card. And we also have to remember that there were not many football cards in the early part of the, the 1900s. It was, it was really, this was when football cards were starting to happen. Um, you know, baseball is the national pastime. Football existed, but football wasn't as big. It wasn't as, uh, as watched and loved as it is now. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to realize that, that, you know, nowadays it's like Sunday is like, you know, all, so many people are watching football and it wasn't like that back at that time, you know, and is that partly because uh, it wasn't on television and it was, every, things were radio and things were stats and newspapers or we don't, I don't really know. I mean, I, I certainly don't know, but football wasn't what it is now. So this is an early, early set of football, a rare card of just like an absolutely dominating player at that time. And this again is a time where there wasn't a lot of passing going on in football. Almost all of it was running plays. So when you have this big, gigantic running back, tailback, fullback that could just move piles and just keep the ball moving up the field. I mean, he was a dominant player and it's a really cool looking card. And I totally get why it would be as expensive as it is. Hey Greg, as for next week's question, I actually already have my grill card. I purchased a 1928 Harrington's ice cream Babe Ruth card last June. This was a card that I always wanted for many reasons. Firstly, Having shifted my collecting focus towards pre-war, Babe Ruth was the top priority guy that I wanted to have a card of. Secondly, I'm a Red Sox fan, so even though Ruth is on the Yankees at this point, the image used on the issue is from around 1917, I believe, and it features him in a Red Sox uniform. Thirdly, I love the set and overall scarcity of it. There are probably around a hundred or so of these Ruth cards in total, and that is not too many, especially when compared to his gouty issues. Finally, I was able to find a PSA 2 with amazing eye appeal that I was absolutely thrilled with. The card is featured as my number one card on my first video of my channel, along with a few others for anyone who is interested in seeing what the cards look like. I am ultimately able to obtain this card by selling off a majority of my collection. I had stopped collecting for around three years, and when I got back into collecting last June, I decided I wanted to sell the majority of the cards I had to go after a grail card that I would certainly cherish for life. I am beyond thrilled that I made the moves that I did to acquire this card. 
I was 20 years old when I got the card. I'm 21 now. And this card is very special to me and one that I plan on keeping for life. There's so many places I could go with this one. I could, I could do a 30-minute video on just this response. There's so many things in here that I find interesting. One, the card itself, right? And, and I've talked a little bit about cards from this time period. Not a lot, because it's, it's certainly not my expertise. It's something I do really enjoy. I'm learning more about, I'm reading more about, I'm, I'm watching videos about, and it, it's definitely a, an era of cards that I like. It's an era of cards that are really rare. Again, like I mentioned you know, a few minutes ago, this is at a time, this, this set, these cards are at a time that the, the United States is not flush. The United States is struggling a little bit, um, and well, not a little bit. The United States was struggling a lot financially at this point, and so the thought of hanging on to some of these things, it just wasn't at the forefront of people's minds. That's interesting. Another thing that's interesting is the consolidation, the taking, you know, the overwhelming majority of a collection and liquidating it to put into one card is a major decision, you know? And for some collectors, they're like, there's no way I could do that. There's no way I could get rid of a whole bunch of my cards just for a card or two. But consolidation is, is, a, is certainly a piece of this particular discussion that I could go a whole, a whole video on, on the consolidation that was done here. But the thing to me that is the most interesting is he bought the card when he was 20. He was 20 years old when he bought this Babe Ruth card. And, you know, one of the things that modern collectors continue to say over and over and over is nobody's going to care about those old cards. Nobody's going to care about those old guys. All the people who care about them are going to die soon and those cards will be worthless. Well, here's a 20, 21-year-old who went all in on a Babe Ruth card. So there are certainly people out there that continue to appreciate this stuff. And I think long term, it's going to pay off for them. Because I, I think that was a good decision to go into a rare Ruth card, especially one with great eye appeal. I think that... I, I th <laughs> I think that there are a lot of people who have been saying for a long time, nobody's going to care about those old players anymore. That is a broken record that has been playing for years. But we can continue to see examples of that not being the case. And this is an example of that not being the case. But there aren't a lot of 20, 21-year-olds who are selling off their collection to get into a Ruth. I think you're ahead of yourself. I think you're ahead of the game. I think you're years beyond your age in understanding what is really rare and what is really going to be in demand and what is really cool. Is that Greg commentary? hundred <laughs> percent. That's what this whole thing is, is Greg commentary, right? Some of you are saying, oh, Greg, you know, what are you talking about? You don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe, I mean... My take is smart decision, great pickup, wise beyond your years. That's my take. My grail card is a 1948 Bowman George Mikan in a collector's grade. When I was younger, I'd often check out the newest Beckett magazine price guide at Barnes & Noble. Was mostly into basketball, and the first set you'd see is the 48 Bowman. The George Mikan had the most eye-popping price next to the Michael Jordan XRC 84 star. Without fail, the Mikan always had the up arrow, indicating the price had gone up since the last issue. With every issue and subsequent price increase arrow, I knew I would never attain this card. Never saw the card in person until I recently had a chance to buy an SGC altered version. I couldn't pull the trigger, even at a reasonable price. The search continues, maybe someday. 
So this Mike and Card is very much like the Nagurski for football. It is for basketball. Again, not a lot of early basketball sets at all. I mean, there were year, there were lots of years where there were not basketball cards at all, um, especially early years. If you think early basketball cards, like pre-1957, 58, this is the card. You know, the 48 Leaf is such an important set because it didn't just produce baseball cards. 49 Leaf, 48 Leaf, you know, that whole thing. But it didn't just produce baseball cards. Cards like the 49 Warren Spawn and the 49 Jackie Robinson and, and the, you know, the the Stan Musial. There are so many great cards in the that Leaf set. But they also did basketball. They did football. They did boxing. It, it was a wide variety of sports. It was such an important set because... It's one of the first major manufactured sets of some of these other sports. And if you think early basketball, I mean like pre-NBA basketball, like the first dominating big man is George Mikan. He's the first dominating big man. And this is the card. Now there are some other cards in that era but this is the card that people point to. This is like the Holy Grail early basketball card, you know, for probably a 10-year stretch until you get to the late 50s with like the Bill Russell and uh, Bob Cousy and then the early 60s with the uh, Wilt Chamberlain. I mean, this is the important basketball card from the earliest basketball sets of the dominant basketball player pretty much on earth um, and and one of the first massive big men that dominated the game. This is the card. The grail card for me is the 1952 Topps Jackie Robinson. Really hoping to snag a copy that fits me and my collection. It is the missing piece to my Jackie run. So... The 52 Tops Jackie Robinson. It's like, it's like where all things intersect is the 52 Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, Jackie Robinson. And you can throw in some others, you know, Campanella and Eddie Matthews. And, but it's really, the, those three are like kind of in a class to themselves. And the thing about them is they're beautiful cards. It's, the first tops full normal trading card set. It's big names that will for, you know, forever be mentioned important, not just in the sport, but in society name recognition through the roof. And they're beautiful. I mean, that dark, deep red background on that Jackie Robinson card is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Just like the dark blue, on the mantle. And, you know, uh, there, are, there are polarizing opinions of the 49 Leaf, 49 Bowman, Jackie Robinson. You know, the 50 Bowman, Jackie Robinson is a great card, but it's a little bit of a distant shot. This kind of hits home where it's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful card. It's tops, which is the preference of a lot of people over Bowman. I still don't 100% understand why that is, but it's it's like it's it's got all the check marks. I mean, this is a card that is going to continue to skyrocket and continue to gain interest. I totally get it. You know, if you look at images, I I don't know if there's an image where where it's a clear tight shot of Jackie Robinson that would be better image than this. It's a it's a gorgeous card, and I totally understand why it has gotten to be so expensive, and it's gotten to be so expensive. And you want to get a centered one? That that 52 top set is impossible to find centered, especially some of the, the cards like this one. And the ones that are, uh, they're not coming up for sale very often. So when you see one, you better get it. And this card is an absolutely top 10 most important cards in the hobby, in my opinion. 
There are two cards that I consider grail cards for my collection. The 54 Tops Ernie Banks and the 57 Tops Bart Star. I think if both cards had the same value, were in the same condition, and the same price, I'd take the star. I think. Shoot. I don't know. All right, you guys know my opinion on the 54 Banks, right? The most beautiful card ever of one of the most likable players ever. I mean, it's a gorgeous card. I, I don't even need it. You guys know my feelings on the 54 Ernie Banks. It's a wonderful card. And I will absolutely own it someday. Win, I don't know. You know, I might end up with one that is really, really well loved. And you guys are going to say, you waited that long for one that looks like that? And I'm going to say, yeah, I, I did. This is, this is the one that looked right. I'll end up with one. Totally get it. Now, as far as the 57 tops, Bart Starr, again, a, a prolific quarterback. One of the when, the, when the era of the quarterback really started taking off, right? You know, I mean, you got Otto Graham a little bit before this, but then 57, you got two really important rookie cards and Johnny Unitas and then Bart Starr. Um, the Johnny Unitas card is a triple print versus the Bart Starr. So the Johnny Unitas, even though some people would say Johnny Unitas, you know, was a better player or has a bigger name, you know, that's a debate I'm not going to get into. But the Bart Starr is significantly more expensive than the Unitas because the Bart Starr is just a regular single print. Um, so it's a lot harder to, to acquire one. Um, it's a beautiful set. The 57 Tops football is an unbelievably cool set. My dad is a huge fan. He always is talking about how much he loves that set. I know as a kid, he remembers his brother uh, buying some packs of those and going, man, these football cards are pretty cool. Um, anyway, so the it's a, it's a great set. It's a, a big name player from a big name team uh, who won a lot of titles, who really start helped start the era of the quarterback. Um, totally understand, totally understand the desire for a Bart Starr rookie card. I'd like to have one in my collection as well. And obviously the Banks, <laughs> it's a no brainer for me. The Ricky Henderson rookie autographed. I mean, for those of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s, I mean, Ricky Henderson, I mean, Ricky Henderson really is an all time great player. He really is an all time great player. And sometimes we think of Ricky Henderson as kind of his quirky personality. But I mean, the amount of hits, the amount of walks, the amount of runs, the leadoff home runs, the speed, the, the way he could change an inning or a game with his, with his stolen bases. I mean, he was a phenomenal player. And when you think of the 80s, you know, kind of like the other thing about the, the Ricky Henderson is for some people, it's sort of like that's the, la that's the end of, of vintage before junk wax era begins, right? When all of the tops and the flair and the Donruss are all starting to now mass produce and more cards are getting out there. This card is kind of like the end of vintage and it's an all time great player. And, you know, he's, he's still with us. You know, I'm actually going to a card show in the Sacramento area here in the not too distant future, uh, might be like a month or two, I'm, I'm losing track, uh, where Ricky Henderson is going to be there signing. And I've, I've thought about getting his rookie card and getting it signed. I mean, because it's like, I, I mean, it'd be pretty cool. Um, so I've thought about that. So I totally get the appeal here. Um, it's such an important card, again, for some of the reasons that I mentioned. Um, and then to get it signed, the only, the only issue with it signed is that it already has the facsimile autograph on it. So it's kind of like, well, it's, it's there already, but you know, as the, the interest in autographed cards has been on the rise for a lot of different reasons the you know, the rarity, but also the fact that it's become more mainstream with the cards in packs with modern cards and stuff that, you know, there we're starting to get to the point where if you want some of the vintage guys uh autographs on their rookie cards you know there's not there's not a ton of those guys around we're starting you know we're, we're losing more and more and more of these guys and so when you have the opportunity i mean it's at least something to consider but such an important card and uh i, I totally get the appeal now for this week's question 
in the same conversation as my video that posted on Saturday, which was all about comparing two cards that looked similar. And in some cases, the lower graded one, I think looked better, looked more appealing to me. Um, yet the sale price seems to continue to be based on the grade, not on the look of the card. Which, you know, everybody continues to say, buy the card, not the grade. Yet, the grade seems to demand higher prices than the eye appeal card. Now, why is that? I, I think that it's very difficult for us to trust our own eyes over one of the major grading companies. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of technical factors that come into play when we're looking at a, uh, a grade, like a little indentation, which might be very difficult to see. The centering on the back of the card, which somebody may not mind much. Uh, a slight circus, a surface wrinkle on the back of the card that, you know, may be hard to notice unless under heavy magnification can dramatically in you know change the the grade of a card from a technical factor but when you look at the card it looks you know beautiful so my question for this week is is based on that concept and and it's something i'm going to be talking about with in a, again adam of vintage sanctuary in in the video this week that's going to post later this week is about eye appeal so my question for all of you is is there going to come a time where the grade is not going to be the primary factor for the price, but the eye appeal will? Will, we, will there be a time where we might see fours selling for more than sevens? We might see fives selling for more than sevens. We might see threes selling for more than fives. Because right now, does it ever happen? Very, very, very rarely there might be an anomaly but almost always the higher grade sells for more. Is it gonna stay that way? Or is it going to transition to the eye appeal is the number one factor for price? Again, I like to be forward thinking. I like to think about where things are heading and some people go, who cares about values? I'm a collector. Greg, Greg, why are you talking about values again, Greg? I'm a collector. I don't care about values. Values don't mean anything to me. Well, if you're a collector, that means you're buying cards, right? So if the value of cards starts changing, then it's going to affect how much you can buy and collect, right? So even if you're never going to sell a card, future values affect you because it affects how much you can buy in the future if you're going to continue to be a part of the hobby. So I think it matters to all of us, even the people who tell me prices don't matter, prices matter. <laughs> At least that's my opinion. Tell me in the comments below, will we ever find a time where a four is selling more than a six because the four is more eye appealing than the six? Let me know what you think.